Welcome to another episode of the Collecting the King show. This is episode 26, and it's called This is the Story. But before we get started, if you like the show, make sure you click the like button. And if you want to subscribe to the show, then click on the subscribe button. And last but not least, click on the bell, and we'll let you know about all upcoming shows. This is episode 26, and this is the story of the RCA Tan Label Original and reissues of Elvis's LP catalog. In 1968, RCA Records made some radical changes to the then 70-year-old record label electronics manufacturer. His master's voice, the iconic dog Nipper, and gramophone image that appeared on every RCA record and phonograph since 1900 was retired. In its place were the letters RCA in a modern block lettering. The infamous RCA Dynaflex label was unveiled in 1971, which was a super thin, lightweight vinyl record, which RCA claimed to be the record of tomorrow. RCA was constantly criticized for their corporate heavy cheapness and questionable product. And I remember very well when the Dynaflex label came out. I didn't understand it at all. Uh, most of my, uh, of course, I started collecting in 1964, so I had all the original RCA records up to that point. And in 1968, they went to an orange label, uh, as a lot of you know, and, and the vinyl was a rigid vinyl. And then for some reason in 71, RCA decided, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to change um, the vinyl and make it flex. And that's what they did. And and as I mentioned before on other shows, it was so flexible, you could wrap it around your arm. That's just to give you an example. It's an exaggeration, but that's close enough. It was very thin. I particularly didn't think the records sounded any better. I mean, maybe you guys do. I don't. I didn't think so. I mean, I played it against my other albums, and it just didn't sound as rich or clear as the other ones. Maybe because the grooves weren't as deep. I don't know. But whatever the case might be, I was not a big fan of the Dynaflex label. Promised Land was released on January 8, 1975, which is also Elvis's birthday. This was the beginning of the transition from orange to tan. Orange was still being pressed in Hollywood, but was pressed on tan in other RCA plants. Elvis Today was released on May 7th in 1975, and it also was pressed on the orange and tan label, depending on the plant. And, of course, I mentioned this before, but just to go over it again, the uh, orange and the tan labels were both released basically at the same time. The whole thing was RCA was, uh, the Hollywood plant was still pressing orange, and uh, Indianapolis and Rockaway had started the new transition to the tan label. So they were pressing uh, Promised Land and Today on tan, and for some reason Hollywood was slow to catch up, and they were still pressing orange. But eventually they did uh, go to tan. The Sun Sessions was released on March 22, 1976, so it was the official first release on the tan label. From Elvis Presley Boulevard, Memphis, Tennessee, was also a release that was first released on the tan label. Welcome to My World followed in April of 1977 and was the first RCA black label release with RCA at the top, Victor on the left, and Nipper just to the upper right of the RCA logo. So I thought the tan label was going to be the new long-run label like the orange was, because the orange lasted from 1968 all the way through to 1975. So that was, what, pretty good seven years, I would think? So I thought the tan, okay, tan's probably going to be around for another seven years or so. But uh, much to my surprise, when Welcome to My World came out, it was black. So that was, you know, kind of unusual, I thought. Now, let's talk about the tan label reissues. From 1975 to late 1976, RCA Records released the majority of Elvis's previous catalog, excluding some of the movie soundtracks on the tan label, many of which were very hard to come by most likely due to the short time period that the tan labels were used. So basically, when they switched to tan, just like they did with the oranges, they re-ran Elvis's catalog and, of course, sent it out uh, that way with the orange Dynaflex uh, and, and, of course, the orange Rigids prior to that. So when the tans came out, they decided, well, we're going to do a run of all of Elvis's catalog. Believe it or not, some of the tan labels are actually worth more than the original pressings. Some tan labels are worth as much as 200 maybe $250 or more. I put together a list from the rarest on down of the tan labels. And, of course, the top of the list being the most valuable. 
The first one is Pure Gold, which was released on 10. This is incredibly, incredibly hard to find. I've never seen it, never had a copy of it, I, I don't believe. If I did, I may have sold it too quick and for too little. But the Pure Gold is probably the rarest, and I think it, it, I've seen it go for as much as $250 to $300, if you can find it. But it was a very, very limited run. That's why. Uh, you know, I don't know. It just came out and went. So uh, at the top of the list is Pure Gold. Next, we have Elvis Sings the Wonderful World of Christmas, which when I did my Christmas show, I pointed out that the tan label was very, very rare. I think the next most uh, rare of all of the tans is Raised on Rock. That one is like next to impossible to find, and it's got to be up there with the other two, uh, price-wise. Over $100, 150 something like that. Next one would be Roustabout, uh, although that was a very you know, popular title and, and sold a, a lot. For some reason, the tan label is very hard to find. Paradise Hawaiian Style is also incredibly hard to find. And then On Stage February 1970, which I just so happen to have here to show you what it looks like. Okay, so this is on stage, um, February 1970, and uh, this is uh, came on a tan label, and here it is. As you can see behind me, I, I uh, just for the hell of it, I decided to make it to make the show more interesting. I put up uh, a lot of the tan labels behind me, uh, and and many of the names that I'm going to name off to you um, are behind me actually. And um, I thought it made a, a cool looking background to have all the tan labels. But anyway, this is a tan label on stage, and it's valued at about a hundred dollars. Then after that, we have uh, Fun in Acapulco. Elvis, the NBC TV special. Boy, that's a hard one to find. I was talking to Johnny B uh, just the other night, and I said, John, what do you think? Name me some of the rarest ones you could think of. And right away he said, the NBC TV special. And I thought about it, and it wasn't on my list. And yeah, actually, uh, he's right. That is really tough to find. Then uh, it kind of drops down in value maybe to like $75, but 75 is still a lot for a record. These are records that are within that price range, and that would be A, a Date with Elvis, uh, Elvis is back, uh, especially with the gatefold cover. I believe somebody told me that it was it had the gatefold cover, but then the tan also came in the single pocket of Elvis's back. I would imagine the one in the in the in the regular, you know, single pocket is probably worth a lot too. But the gatefold cover for sure. Next, of course, is uh, Elvis Presley, which is the LSP 1254, and of course uh, Elvis, which is the LSP uh, 1382. Uh, Girl Happy is next to Impossible. King Creole is very, very hard to find. Kissing Cousins. Boy, I don't think I've ever seen a Kissing Cousins tan, to be honest. Loving You is another one I don't think I've ever seen. It's something for everybody. Now they're becoming a little more common, okay, but still worth at least, you know, 40 bucks, somewhere in that range. And that would be something for everybody. Uh, Elvis, that's the way it is. This is also uh, in that range, too. Elvis as recorded at Madison Square Garden. And this is also a tan label. And again, this is pretty hard to find. This is not an easy one to come by. But this is another example of a, you know, $35, $40 range uh, album, depending on the condition. Um, but this is one of the lower ones. Although I think they go even lower than that. Because some of them, like, for example, Elvis's Gold Records 1 through 4 on tan dime a dozen you can find them all over the place then there's a couple here i wanted to mention that were um, in question uh when john and i were talking he came up with an interesting uh conversation we had with a collector a long time ago who i bought a large collection from and he had like every single tan label there was and according to him at one point in time he actually ran across elvis recorded live on stage in memphis on a tan label I don't think we have it in the price guide uh, because I've never seen it. I, I don't know if it exists, but uh, this collector, uh, and I guess I could say his name, Ryan Pearson, uh, and I know Ryan watches the show. How you doing, Ryan? I was telling him that you had talked to John, and uh, you were telling John that you actually had this in your hands at one point. And I remember the conversation because uh, I was kind of blown away because I'd never, ever seen a tan of live on stage in Memphis. Uh, but according to what you told us, you said that you actually had it in your hands, and you almost bought it, but you put it back. <laughs> Boy, that was the biggest mistake of your life, I would say, because if any 
tan label is worth hundreds of dollars, even more than the pure gold, it would be that one. Because I don't think anybody's ever seen it. We're only going by what you said. I remember personally somebody uh, from New York at a show one time told me that they actually uh, had a tan label double trouble. I doubt that very much. And I even told him he was crazy and he told me I was crazy. And I think we went back and forth about it. But, you know, double trouble... Uh, came out, uh, I, I believe there was an orange rigid found of Double Trouble, but that was in 68, around the time the album had come out anyway. It's only a, a couple years apart. So that was discovered, and I think that's in the book. But there would have had to have been an orange flex in order for there to be an, uh, an orange or a, or a tan label, uh, because uh, Double Trouble was deleted in, in 68 and then made its return in 77 after Elvis died, along with several other soundtracks that had been deleted. So whether or not Double Trouble exists on Tan Label, I, I, I doubt it. Here's some uh, variations. The Tan Label of Elvis Country, uh, Elvis Now, and Back in Memphis, for some odd reason, they both had side A and side B and then side one and side two variations. For some reason, RCA decided they were going to give it a shot and change. I don't know, maybe they were going to change all of them. So I don't know why they just limited it to uh, Elvis Country and Elvis Now and El back in Memphis. But that's what they did. So when you're looking for records through records and stuff and you see a tan label of either of these, what I would strongly suggest is you look for that side A, side B variation because that's the rare one. The tan labels of these records... Uh, you know, Elvis Country is definitely uh, sought after. Elvis Now is definitely sought after. and But back in Memphis isn't that much, unless it has the side A, side B. So I, I hope I've made that kind of clear, that the side A, side B um, is, the, is the variation you want to get on the tan labels of those three albums. Another rare variation, and I think I had this on one of my earlier shows, um, and I even did a seal to reveal because I thought I found another copy. But that would be the Gold Records 4 tan label. Now, I mentioned that Gold Records 1, 2, and 3, and 4 are the most common on tan, and they are. However, there was, for some reason, a mistake uh, uh, at, in the factory where they were going from the tan to the AFL 1s. Of course, all the a a AFL 1s were black labeled. But for some odd reason, there was a uh, copy of... Um, Elvis's Gold Records, Volume 4, and inside was an AFL-1 tan label. Very, very unusual, very, very rare. I, I, I think I had one in an earlier show I might have shown, and then I found another copy, and I opened it, sealed to reveal, and it wasn't the, the AFL-1. And if there is another tan label AFL-1, please let me know in the comments below. But as far as I know, that's the only tan label that has an AFL-1 catalog prefix. And then we come up with a very, very oddball release that John told me about. Uh, we were in Las Vegas one time, and, you know, of course we hit all the record stores uh, along with the casinos and whatever. And I remember we were, um, on, on the day we were supposed to fly out, we had some time to kill, and there was this antique mall near the airport. It's probably not there anymore, but um, this is quite a, a long time ago. So we went looking, looking through the mall to see if we could find any records. John and I were walking down an aisle, and he saw this box on the ground, and, and he says, well, I'm going to look at these records. So he bends down, looks on these records, and he pulls up uh, Worldwide Gold Award Hits Parts 1 and 2. And what that is, is that's the box set. Okay, that came out, the 50 Gold Award Hits, which was a box set, and there were four LPs in it. But it was divided up. And I'm not really sure the year. For some reason, I looked it up, and Presley Anna says 73, but I doubt it's 73, and I'll tell you why. Because when he pulled out the records, one was orange and one was tan. And we matched up the numbers to make sure there was no confusion, and they were definitely identical. They were definitely, that, that first album went with that second album in that cover. But I've never seen it ever since. This was the only copy I ever saw. So when you're at record stores or looking around for records and you run across a uh, 50 Gold Award Hits Parts 1 and 2, you always got to look inside because uh, the majority of them are tan and there are some that are black. Uh, there are no orange labels of this where both records are orange. There are none, okay? But for some bizarre reason, there's an orange 
and a tan label in the first pressing of this thing. Now, as I said, it, it, we thought it was 1973. It's in the book that way. I don't know if Jerry put it in that way or I don't remember doing it myself. But it's not. it couldn't possibly be 73 because it, there's a tan label. It's just very bizarre because uh, it would mean the tan label. If it was 73, that would mean the tan label came out in 1973. But it didn't. But here's where this is weird because by 1976, the orange labels were gone. I think it's probably one of those crossover periods where they had um, they had pressed they started pressing on orange and then said no wait a minute we're going to tan now and just combined the two together. So technically speaking, I I, I think it would be 1975 that that package came out. Um, uh, but it's a very rare uh, uh, record. It's not all tan. It is tan and orange, but something you should keep your eye open for. I also wanted to mention the box sets, Gold Records Volume One. And volume two. Here is Worldwide Gold Award Hits volume two, uh, which was the companion set to uh, volume one. This this set, of course, included uh, the, the the flip sides of many of Elvis's number one hits or biggest hits, and then it also included songs from the uh, EPs, which were also million sellers. The the first time it came out, it had a cloth swatch. Like an, it came in an envelope, and it was a piece of Elvis's clothing, supposedly. There was somewhere I read that there was an article that the cloth swatch may not be, may have not been Elvis's clothing. Uh, other people said it was, or RCA said it was. I don't know, but anyway, uh, it had a cloth swatch of Elvis's clothes in an envelope, and it also had a poster, all right, which was the painting. I think it's June Kelly uh, painting of Elvis uh, in the white jumpsuit with the uh, red sash belt. Uh, or whatever, uh, with a blue background. This did not come with those, and I'll open it up just to show you here. These box sets are always so hard to open. And by the way, they're, you got to be really careful when you open these, otherwise you can split the lid, and the lid, you know, the lid comes right off. Um, but here, let's take a look at it. And here we go. As I said, a lot of the reissues were... Um, worth more than the first pressing sometimes but not in this case i have seen many many copies of uh both of these box sets on on tan so i would not say that these are incredibly rare but you know if you collect the tan labels you would definitely want to put the two box sets in your collection uh, another thing I want to mention too is when you're maybe searching on eBay or you're you, you you know you're hunting for records and stuff, and you come across a tan label, and all of a sudden it's a record that maybe I didn't mention, or you find a tan label, girl happy or a tan label something. Well, here's a little buyers beware, all right. And I know I have uh, Canadian viewers, so those of you from Canada already know this, but um, a lot of records uh, reissues came out on tan. In Canada more so than the United States but I just wanted to make a note that you always always check the label the uh, the back cover or even the label itself when you find a tan record and make sure it doesn't say Canada so just a little buyers beware uh, about that okay so r wrapping up on the, the tan labels I just wanted to say that you know I, I particularly like the tan labels I think they're cool uh, and they were only out for a short period of time. And so, you know, I've had a few younger collectors say to me, well, I want to start collecting. What what would you suggest I collect? Well, I, you know, I, I said, well, you could always start with the black label reissues from 77, you know, because Elvis's complete catalog was pretty much out on that. And they're cheaper. They're not as expensive. You know, you could pick them up for anywhere from 10 to 15 bucks a piece, sometimes even less than that. And if you just want to get one of each title, that's cool. But what I would really suggest is that if you want to really challenge yourself and get into the collecting world and understand things, try to collect. start off by collecting the tan labels. And now it's time for the black case. Yep, I know. I didn't do it last show. So here we go. I have some cool things in here. So here, excuse me, Nipper. The black record case, uh, which I always... Uh, put the, the rarer, more unusual items in. I thought I'd have some fun and show you some things here that I thought were cool. Uh, number one, um, speaking of Aloha from Hawaii, uh, Steve uh, Orlando came over the other day and he asked me if I, I had ever seen this, all right? 
And the, here is, oh, I'm going to have to move the case. Sorry. So, uh, of course, have you ever seen a law from Hawaii? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, a thousand times. He says, yeah, but have you ever seen it with the sticker applied directly to the cover? I said, the only time I've ever heard of the, the stickers being attached to the cover was when they were attached to the front cover of the promo. And, and it had a promo in Boss Promo Stamp. That's the only time I've ever seen that. You know what? Somebody probably took the sticker off the shrink and just put it on the album cover. Because there's no shrink on this, as you can see. You know, I kind of looked at this thing and went, what in the world... I mean, this sticker is perfectly applied. Uh, I personally don't think any anybody could have taken this sticker off the shrink wrap and applied it to this cover so perfect. So, for whatever reason, I'm not saying this is a variation because I don't think it is. I think maybe uh, an employee at a at a factory somewhere um, just decided to put the sticker on the cover. Uh, very odd um, because the shrink wrap would have been on this. They would have took the shrink wrap wrap off, uh, and maybe the the quad sticker was on the front, and then they ripped up, ripped it off, and and this was underneath. Maybe he started by the, putting this on the cover, and then he put the shrink wrap on, and then put on the quad sticker, and said, "Oh, oh, I wasn't supposed to put it on the cover, was I? Okay. Well, anyway." <laughs> I don't know. I'm just speculating here, folks. But anyway, you have to admit, this is kind of strange, you know, because it is perfectly, and I mean perfectly, applied to the back cover. And the only way that could have been done, in my opinion, is at the factory. So it's a mystery. Why was this? If any of you out there have an album where any of these stickers are applied directly to the cover and it's not a promo, let me know. But I thought it was kind of unique and rare and since we had done the whole show on Aloha from Hawaii I thought I would put it in the black case and show it to you all right now this is what this one is uh, this one is for fun okay this one is for fun first uh, here is uh, obviously this is uh, it happened at the World's Fair uh, this is the new FTD right and it is still sealed and it has a sticker on it and of course this is how it came out in the year 2023 this is how it came out in the year 1963 so actually you know what this is the 50th anniversary no 60th anniversary of the release of it happened at the world's fair but anyway i thought this was pretty cool i thought some of you might want might want to see it um just got my hands on this just recently but here is the original uh it happened at the world's fair in the baggie uh as you can see the um stereo here over here it says stereo right and then it has the price tag up here in the corner Okay, and that's, uh, I've talked about this a thousand times. The, these bags were uh, in, in record stores or in Sears Roebuck or Montgomery Wards or whatever. And the records were shipped, always shipped, without any protective covering whatsoever. And then the records would get to the stores and then the records, they would be put in baggies. So for those of you who have never seen a, a, an original RCA Elvis album in a baggie, there it is. That's exactly what they look like. That's how they came back in 1963. So that's pretty cool. I thought I thought it was kind of neat that here is uh, the past. Or wait a minute. Here's the past, <laughs> and then here is the present. Anyway, both of them are actually pretty cool covers, wouldn't you say? I would think so. Nipper, you're in the way. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I, I thought that was kind of cool to show you what, what it looked like in the baggie when it first came out. Okay, and then last but not least, here, I just got this off the internet, and those of you who uh, are always looking for um, cassettes, uh, in, especially Jules, who uh, uh, I got him going on cassettes, and then I got going, going on cassettes as well, um, these uh, showed up, uh, a buyer that I bought from before, these showed up on his uh, uh, eBay page, and uh, he had about five or six of them, and I, I went bonkers. I bid on every single one, and I only got one. But check this out. Now, everybody knows that when uh, uh, compact discs came out, 
they came out in what was called a long box. And the reason uh, up here would be the compact disc with the window that showed the disc. And then there was a box that went down here. And, and it was used for uh, shoplifting protection reasons so that it would make it hard for somebody to walk out of the store with it. Well, here's one for a cassette. I mean, how cool is this? It's a cassette. I've never, you know, I mean, I was around this time when the cassettes were being sold. I don't ever remember a cassette coming in a long box. I think that's pretty cool. I've seen eight tracks in long boxes, and I'm sure that's where they got the idea. But, uh, yeah, there it is. And this is uh, He Walks Beside Me, which obviously came out in 1978. And this is all sealed. But um, the guy I got this from, boy, he had a bunch of, I mean, he had a bunch of titles. But it seemed like they were all after Elvis's death. There were no originals. I mean, they were uh, maybe Our Memories of Elvis or Guitar Man or whatever. But it was all from that same time period um, that, that he had. I was lucky I at least got one. So uh, those of you out there, especially Jules, if you got the other ones, you lucky son of a gun, you. Um, anyway, isn't that kind of cool? I thought it was. So I thought I'd show that out of the black box those of you who've been watching the shows know that the last show i did was called aloha from hawaii i was quite surprised to see how many comments there were about that show regarding the chicken of the sea sticker you know i'm not saying anybody's right or wrong but i will say what i believe what i don't believe number one i i somebody said and a, and a few of them said that the sticker was made by Paul Lichter because it, I believe someone said it either appeared in his book or it didn't appear in his book. And I'm unclear on that because I didn't, I, I, I don't have a lot of Paul's books. I do have a uh, boy who dared to rock and I don't remember seeing it in that book. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's in there, but anyway, I wish Paul was still with us because I would love to ask him uh, or, or see what he felt about that theory that he was responsible for that sticker. But I don't believe it was him. I, I don't believe he had anything to do with it. Okay, And I'll tell you why. When I first started collecting, and I first looked at the first uh, volume of Presleyana 1, there was a listing in Presleyana 1 uh, for the, the Chicken of the Sea sticker. And I have here a, a picture that Jerry Osborne sent to me. Jerry, from what I understand, is the one who discovered the sticker. Not made the sticker, but discovered the sticker. This is a, a, a picture from Presleyana 1 of the, the sticker as it first appeared in 1980. And down below, you'll notice there's this flyer, little promotional flyer, okay? Now, according to Jerry, this flyer came with this album when it was distributed to the employees. This is the listing in Presleyana 1, and this was in 1980. And let me read it to you. It says, Chicken of the Sea in-house promotional package consists of standard copy of the LP plus sneak preview and ad schedule printed materials, meaning that it was the record, the sticker, and this uh, thing I showed you, this kind of flyer thing. Okay, and under the notes, it says... After our 1978 investigation into this Chicken of the Sea sticker, it was proven conclusively that RCA neither authorized this packaging nor was involved in its production. In fact, until we brought it to their attention, they were not even aware of it. Our conversation with Chicken of the Sea, uh, Van Camp's executives, revealed that only a few dozen, perhaps 50 copies, were made of this package, all of which were distributed within the organization. This is what I remember, because I remember getting Presleyana 1, and this was not too long after I had uh, The Boy Who Dared to Rock, which I think came out uh, like a couple years prior to this. Apparently, back in 1973, uh, Jerry was living in Arizona, and he received some kind of a call or a letter from uh, a gentleman who lived in San Diego and who said that he was an employee of Van Camp's uh, uh, Chicken of the Sea division or whatever, and he had this Elvis record with a sticker on it and wanted to know if Jerry was interested in it. So Jerry then um, said, sure, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see it and everything. And uh, while he was telling me the story on the phone, he, he, he was you know, having a little bit uh, hard time remembering some of the details. 
But he did say that the guy uh, was an employee, and somehow, uh, he doesn't know whether he paid for it, or the guy gave it to him, or whatever the case might be, and he got the record from this guy. So um, he put it away in his collection for a long time, and then he said about the time that Presliana uh, 1 came out, he decided to include it in the book. So I asked Jerry, I said, you know, um, uh, do you have any details about this? Is there any, any other verification that you can give me uh, on this story? Because a lot of people think that the sticker itself is fake uh, because of the way it looks and this and that. But, uh, you know, if it was made by Chicken of the Sea and not by RCA, that would explain a lot of why the, the lettering looks kind of weird, like somebody wrote it themselves. And it, it kind of looks like it was done in an art department and it was done real quick. Somebody that's not familiar with RCA stickers. So after our conversation, he emailed uh, a woman at uh, Consumer Affairs Team at uh, Chicken of the Sea International. I'm reading what, what, uh, what she said to him. Uh, Dear Jerry Osborne, thank you for contacting Chicken of the Sea. Uh, after further reviewing the initial information provided, we are kindly requesting uh, assistance retrieving photos of the album. Uh, please also attach them to this email for further review. At this point in time that we're recording this show, this uh, woman from the uh, Consumer Affairs Department has not responded back. Jerry did send her uh, a photo, so we're waiting to get a response from her. And, uh, and then we'll kind of take it from there. So this goes to what I believe now. A lot of people said you could tell that it's fake because the sticker looks kind of, you know, amateurish. If RC had nothing to do with it and the sticker was made by Chicken of the Seas Art Department, <laughs> that would explain why it doesn't look all that great. Not exactly sure when they received the album. I would imagine they got copies of the album. RCA sent them copies of the album. And they designed the sticker to resemble the Saturn design. And then they put made a sticker and, and put it on there and gave it to the employees. So this guy that contacted Jerry worked there. Jerry said that he thinks he has the guy's name. He'd have to look for it. So let's just say that whole thing is under investigation. But this is this all makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, not just because I, I, I first saw it in Presiana 1, uh, but um, it just makes a lot of sense. So um, I'll keep you up to date with this on the next show once uh, we hear back from Chicken of the Sea and uh, see what they uh, say when they answer Jerry. And as always, I want to thank all the viewers and subscribers uh, for, for watching. Don't forget to send me your inquiries and want lists to collectingthekeng at gmail.com for pricing, shipping, and payment details. We have over 1,000 Elvis 45 CDs and LPs in stock, as well as RCA promotional items, sheet music, authentic Las Vegas and tour souvenirs, and more. We don't have a list or catalog available, which is why we encourage you to send inquiries and want lists. If we don't have something you're looking for, we might be able to find it for you. So don't forget to contact us at collectingtheking at gmail.com. Uh, I am Robert Allen and I am out of here.